about tonight is uh, why you should publish your crappy script um, or shiny script. Um, this is uh, based on a lightning talk I gave back at FOSCON uh, last year. Um, FOSCON this year is coming up August 25th, Saturday. Um, so if you're not otherwise occupied, uh, you should be there. If you are otherwise occupied, you should find whoever has you busy and bring them with you. That's true. That's true. Um, so th this is a, a slide uh, pen that plugged last month or yeah, last week, hopefully, uh, threw together for us quick and early. So. Um, what we're talking about basically is, you know, you have scripts that you've written, um, you haven't shared them because you think they're terrible and you're probably right, um, but you should share them anyway because other people will appreciate it and you might get some use out of doing so. So why should you publish your crappy script? Um, so the first reason is you'll write better crappy scripts. Um, knowing that others will be looking at your code, you'll be more interested in making it look better. Uh, you'll hopefully comment it better because other people will be reading it, which will help you out in the future when you're uh, trying to figure out what it does. Um, you'll write more flexible code. Uh, you might have taken shortcuts, like not added options that let you, you know, pass a parameter or do something a little bit different. You might have hard-coded variables in like five or six times uh, where you should have actually used a variable and referenced it. Um, you might you know, take a moment to fix that. Stuff that doesn't take too long if you do it when you're first writing the script, but is a pain later when you come back and forget about all the different places you, you know, use that IP address or uh, save that credential or something in your script that you shouldn't have, anything like that. Um, so basically, you know, you'll write better code. Uh, places where you would have taken a shortcut, you'll stop and make things a little bit better. Other people will improve on your crappy script. So maybe they will, maybe they won't. But if you don't put it somewhere where others can see it, comment on it, add to it, they definitely won't. Um, so, you know, if you add it to GitHub or some kind of versioning system, other people can make comments, other people can uh, add feature requests so that people can complain about things that are awful about your terrible script. And when you react to those, you'll make your script better. And maybe you'll have an idea for functionality you didn't expect to ever need or use, but you know, it's actually useful to you. Uh, you stole the code for your crappy script. You probably got it all off Stack Exchange anyway, uh, or from, you know, wherever there were a couple comments last time on uh, what people are using instead of Stack Exchange, I guess not. Um, but, you know, you're probably reusing code and bit pasting bits and pieces together and duct taping everything until it works. Uh, so you can do something a little bit better yourself. Instead of you replying to some forum comment somewhere asking how to do something, you can put your stuff on, uh, on a repo and others can find it and search for it. Uh, this is your chance to get that example that you stole from Stack Exchange out and invest in it, add to it and put it somewhere maintainable, just like the original author would have done if they had come to this talk in the first place. You can show off your crappy script if you want to. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's so terrible that you're like, I don't want the world to ever see that I, I did this. Um, a lot of times I think we, we say to ourselves, you know, I'll publish it later when it's better and, you know, it's better quality and then we just, we just never do. Um, but, you know, if you haven't published stuff to a repository before. Uh, maybe a simple script is a good way to get there. You can publish it, figure out how everything works, and now you don't have a new skill. You know how to, how to do that. And as you maintain that script and add to it, you'll you know, learn how to do that properly. Um, the next time you'll already know how. And you can work towards having a repository of less and less crappy scripts, eventually having something you actually do want to show off. Uh, but the old work, you know, it, it's still valuable. Um, you might have stuff in there you reference later, and anybody looking at it and saying, you know, you've evolved and you've improved your, uh, your work. Uh, you'll be able to find your crappy script. So this is one that's bit me several times. Um, I, you know, I wrote something cool, it's useful, I need it again now. Where did I write it? Where did I leave it? Um, 
Was it on a work machine? Did I do that at home? I don't know where it is. It's in you know bar temp somewhere on some server, and I'll never find it again. So then I write a new crappy script that's purpose is to log in everywhere and find my old crappy script. Mm -hmm. Or instead of doing that, I can put it into a repo where I'll be able to find it next time. Um, on top of that, you know, you have uh, snippets of code that you've written. Um, you have little bits and pieces that you've borrowed and copied and pasted, and now you have uh, improved code laying all over the place, but not nestled together, not maintained. So you might have a, a little snippet of code you've reused hundreds of times, and you have hundreds of different, slightly better than the last variants, but when you go to look for it the next time, are you going to find the right one, or are you going to find two-year-old work and, and reuse that? Um, so, you know, if you do that, your improvements never make it back. Uh, if you put it in a repo, you can keep the improvements. You can always find the latest one. You can still look back at your, your old versions. You don't have script one, script two, script three, and maybe script three is actually the last one. I'm not sure. Um, you stand on the shoulders of giants who wrote crappy scripts, and now it's your turn. Uh, the whole mess of open source software is basically people sharing work and leveraging that work and, and making something better. My Skyrim background. If that's, yes, still your Skyrim background. I, all of the other slides are lightning, by the way, except for this one, which is uh, Jenny over there fighting a dragon. Um, it's Jenny over there beating the crap out of the dragon. Beating the crap out of the dragon. Um, so, you know, with, by sharing our code, we give the next generation of developers and ourselves um, something to reference. And, a leg up on making less graphics scripts. Uh, so this was a rehash of my lightning talk from uh, FOSCON last year, and again, plug last week and today. And now I'm going to show you a couple of my graphics scripts. Um, so a, a little bit of background. Um, I had this dumb idea. I had this uh, PDU that I got from someone on the plug mailing list some time ago. It's a Baytech 8-port PDU. Um, it has remote access, sort of, kind of. Uh, here I am logged into its Telnet interface, which is the only option other than the serial port. Um, so I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, this is cool. I can, I can go in here, I can turn outlets on and off, but I really don't want to Telnet into this thing every time I want to do something with it, and I'm like, what, what cool thing can I do with this? And I'm just thinking, well, I want to put a light out on my, uh, my deck. We just moved a little bit ago, and you know, when we were moving, we're unloading stuff from the car, and we can't see anything, and there's not enough lighting out there. So I'm like, I want to put a light out on the deck, but um, it'd be cool if I could control it remotely. Um, so I'm like, well, I could totally take out my phone and load up ConnectBot and Telnet into the PDU, and that sounds like a great plan, except not really. Um, so you know, I'm looking at this thing, and it's it's a menu-driven UI. So you know, you go in here, you say, I want to do outlet control. Uh, after you log in, you know, give it a username and password, I want to do outlet control. Um, now I can choose which outlets I want to turn on and off by typing out. Um, it's like on, one, and then it asks you, are you sure you want to turn on outlet one? Yes, I really am sure. Um, so, well, that's, that's terrible. Why did you use no light switch? This is way more fun than a light switch. And besides that, how can I flip that light switch from my phone? I'd have to get one of these fancy newfangled... You can throw your phone at the light switch. I've actually He's done that. that. You, you, need, you, He's you, done need, that. you need a thing longer. <laughs> a what? From, I, I'll show a thing longer. Okay, I, some change. sort of extend the arm thing? Something like that. Like it's a something. big stick like Homer Simpson. So, or a thing longer like, like long the thing professor, thing. like Dr. Uh, Farnsworth. 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 So here we have a uh, ASCII lightning because we're on a telnet interface and we can't do graphics. Um, but, you know, so I, I'm looking around online a little bit. I'm like, well, somebody must have done this. I can click these links, right? That's cool. I can't click these links. Um, so somebody must have done this. So how can I do the same thing? Do the same thing by breaking out of my presentation so that I can... There we go. Well, I found this lovely uh, article here where this guy made a uh, .NET GUI. And I'm like, well, can't be that hard, right? Um, then I'm reading a little bit more about his .NET. 
<laughs> yeah, it's you know, it's great. Um, like, well, I you know, if he did it, I can do it. And then I'm reading a little bit of his commentary, and it's like it works on this very specific firmware version because it's reading the terminal, and if, you know, you're running a different firmware version, it stops working because the characters are in different byte positions, um, stuff like that. So I'm like, all right, well, we just did something the other day to deal with uh, these asterisk. Uh, licenses that are from Digium that you have to type a bunch of stuff to get get done. And we did it in Expect. So I, uh, I'm like, well, I can probably do this in Expect. So it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, we start up Expect and we say, I want you, here I have my comment, I see I have my comments that show me how to use it for when I forget. Um, there's a 20 second timeout, so if you send the commands and it seems like things aren't working, it'll end after 20 seconds. Uh, we set five variables based on the command lines you passed it, so it's, you know, user, it's the, um, actually the IP address, it's poorly named name because I stole the crappy script from somebody else and repurposed it. Um, user, password, outlet, and state of on or off. Uh, so we fire up telnet, um, we wait, the script waits until it sees enter username, sends the username you passed it, enter password, sends the password you passed it, waits for the menu, and I'm watching for this outlet control string. Um, then we send a one to go to the outlet control. We wait for circuit breaker. And then we send, I want to set outlet, I want to turn on outlet one. Um, then we're going to get basically the list of outlets back as a response to that. And we say, well, actually, no, we say, uh, are you sure you want to turn on outlet one right here? So I'm only watching for outlet. And I say yes. And then when we finally see circuit breaker, that means we're done and we can bail out of the script. Um, so so how do you send this script, though? How do I send this script? Yes, how do you execute this script? So I basically just say, I'm going to log in right now. So you're still telling in Yes, this script is telling me. So you, so you, you on your phone or your, because you, so you're in your car and you've pulled up the driveway and you want the light to go. Right, on. right. So now I have to SSH in to run this script, right? That's. So you have to SSH in to run the script. That, that's not super useful. Um, well, but it does limit your uh, security <laughs> perimeter. Yes. Now I'm SSH. Yes. Now I'm SSH in absolutely, it absolutely does that. Now I, I don't have to open Telnet to the world. Um, you, have, you have to actually SSH into something to get to this. So that's, you know, it's an improvement, but it's still terrible. Um, so then we have this PHP script. And what the PHP script does, yeah, what the PHP script does is it runs the expect script for you after rendering a, a, a pretty awful GUI. Um, and I'm, there, this is, you know, to, to go with the talk, this is a crappy script. There is a glaring security hole, which I'm sure you guys can find, oh, cool. um, where you can execute arbitrary magic. <laughs> yeah, I think you just went backwards. Yeah. <laughs> well, from a security perspective, possibly, but I have to be on my Wi-Fi, so it's ah. it's arguably about the same. Fair. Um, so all this gives us here, and it, you know, this is it's not very good. It's hard coded. We have some HTML down here that renders a little table with a couple options on it. Um, let me let me fire that up for you real quick, and then we're going to turn on the exhaust fan in my uh, basement. Here we go. Big moment right here. The fan is now on. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you all can hear the whirring wind, um, that's the sound of the fan. I had contemplated ripping this thing out of the out of where I spent the weekend setting it up and bringing it here to show you guys, but that wouldn't have been very yeah, lightning -y anymore. So, all you had to do was set up like set up a Google Hangouts like video chat to mm. like between yourself. And yeah, we could have watched the fan. We could watch the fan turn on and off. Yep. You actually can't see the fan either, so that oh. maybe if we put the camera really close, you'd be able to hear it. Yeah. Um, and the, the PDU itself makes a nifty clicking noise when you. It makes uh, an annoying really clicking noise. 
when the relays fire. It's really cool when you do the power on all and it goes tick, 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 tick as it lights up all eight outlets <laughs> in like a quarter second apart. So that was my crappy script solution to doing something sort of useful with this PDU. Um, it has six more outlets, so I have to find six creative things to add to this. That, you know, <laughs> some, some disco lighting, I think. That would um, be necessary. You know, something like that. So, oh, that awesome lamp we have in the corner? Yeah, I was actually That's considering that. Yes. Yeah, 100%. I am, I am on board with that. Um, and then I have the bonus script before we have uh, Walt come up and present. The bonus script has nothing to do with the power control. Um, this is my well, okay. ancient MySQL logger. Oh, God. Um, so everything you guys say to me on uh, IRC is stored for all eternity. Um, and then, of course, the replica that goes to the NSA as well. Yeah. Um, so it, it's you know it's really simple. This plugs into IRSSI. Um, it's actually based off of this stolen script here. But I did at least you know offer some attribution, which does which doesn't work because I did something wrong by copy and paste. But, um, Basically what the original script did is if anytime somebody sent the URL on IRC, it would log that URL on MySQL. And I'm like, hey, that's cool, except I want to log everything. So um, I took his code and I added some functions so that the meat and potatoes really is right here where I'm adding signals to IRSSI for like public messages, joins, parts, notices, kicks, events, um, quits, my own notices and publics and so forth, and I'm writing them all in MySQL um, in these various things here. And we were actually talking about it a little bit before we came here, because I have like a secondary archival script. I only keep 30 days on my Linux because the disk started to balloon out of control. Um, so every minute there's a cron job that takes anything that's not archived and shoves it somewhere else and then marks it as archived and deletes stuff that's older than 30 days. Which I probably should have brought that here too. I don't have that. I'm, I'm a dummy, and I don't have that published anywhere. So um, maybe next time I give this talk, I'll uh, include that. So that's my uh, couple crappy scripts and uh, a brief presentation on why you should also share yours, as Walton is about to share his with us now. Very polished compared to the turn I'm about to show you guys. <laughs> Is it written in Ruby? Or are they written in Ruby? Yes, they of course are. they're written in Ruby. Yes, they are. Do they tell that to things? No. No, they don't, but it's, so, it's terrible. So so do they do they um so how how would the Mac Ruby team bless your work? Terrible. Very terrible. So so oh, I see Walt's uh, idle RPG. Yes, I'll show you. This button. Right. So, right. So I'm in this idle RPG. It's on IRC channel, and um, I never, you know, so I don't always. You don't always get alerted because sometimes the messages are they're like this guy where there was a team battle. Do you know what an idle RPG is? Never. They're just yes. basically you sit. Here, I'll show. I'll show you an example. Of that. It's going to be super exciting, yes. It is going to be super exciting. Well, I don't know if you can read that. Um, yeah, I can definitely. Know. This is awesome. I didn't know this was like this. So how but do you, you just sit there? You just sit there. You don't. The whole idea is you don't do anything. In fact, you're penalized if you do anything. And. So it's basically who who stays connected the longest is how you Yeah, except there's the randomness. You get you end up getting disconnected, like this person down here gets disconnected. And so it's tough. I don't know why I'm so G seven? I'm not join that. It's not it's not on Freenode. Oh, then I'm not gonna join that. There might be one on Freenode too, who knows? There are a bunch of them. There are there's definitely at least a couple on Freenode. Um, so I, I basically look like once a day just to make sure I haven't gotten disconnected from some reason. 
But sometimes like this thing here, where you only alert it if you're the first name, and you're the third name, you're not. So you, um, so I don't get alerted for that. The other thing that happens is, occasionally someone, they have these things that are called quests, and if someone disappears while they're on a quest, that everyone gets like a 15% like time of the time added on. It's complicated, there's a formula based on what level you are. Uh, but you often don't get notified of that. It could have scrolled way off the screen by that. So I just wrote this very complicated uh, SQL where I do this join. And basically, what am I looking for? Uh, these couple of channels. I think for one point, I was in two different ones now. One. And I'm going for the, the last 21 days. And I'm looking for something that either has my nick in it or it says gaping because the phrase that when someone disappears from quests quest has the phrase gaping maw in it. Um, so anyway, now this takes a while to run because I have 18 million records in this. Um, that wasn't so bad. Six seconds. Probably cash. Then. It was cash because of it. Oh, this is right. We needed to see this. This is the fig water. This is very important. One of his fingers, you can press things from far away. Okay, sure. uh, is this readable at all? Yeah. yeah. So oh, we can put that down. I, I don't see there's a glare. Right now. Yeah, there, I forgot to put down the the, the, the camera will get the glare, so that's the it's, both, it's mostly for the camera of anything. <laughs> So John puts everything into one table. I think I have four tables. I have a table for networks, NICs, channels, and messages. But you know, basically every message has that goes in gets those four things and then the text of the message, right? So it has the message ID, the network ID, the channel ID, the the, well, the message ID and the message are the only thing that kind of unique to it. And I also have a time added and the message which is just a text. And I don't know, that's about all there is really to it. And then my script, oh, I also have another one for SQL, for SQLite, which is pretty much the same thing except it's less complicated. And my script is which I call my skull logger. You see that I also stole it from some somebody. I think I stole it from the same place yeah. John stole his from. Yeah, that's it, uh, and, and you can see that I don't I don't even think I have a uh, password on the database. So whatever. You can only get to it from inside my box. So if you're in the box. What do I do? I prepare a bunch of statements. I don't know, this is probably more complicated than it needs to be, but yes. you know, it's it's more complicated because it has to deal with the four tables. So every time there's a message, it has to check what nick ID and channel ID and other things are. Right. Uh, but otherwise it's more or less the same because I'm just adding more stuff to it. Uh, so that's under my GitLab under uh, IRSSI. GitHub. Yeah. GitHub. Did I say GitLab? GitLab. 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 <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go. Uh, yeah. I want to show.
show a different shoddy script than I did last time. I should show that one. Uh, yeah, it was you that had the SQL on it. I was trying to remember that. Is that readable? It's yeah. really dark, isn't it? Yeah, it's readable. It's readable. Okay. okay. So this shoddy, I wrote this shoddy script. Like, I thought I would let you talk about it. I might even know this. I remember this. Um, so the problem I was having was when I was in grad school at Drexel, you had to remember to, you always had to, every month you had to order a trail pass if you were taking the train. And you always had to do it for a month ahead of time. So it was like the fourth, the deadline was the fourth Monday. So this month is, it's probably coming up. So we're in April. So I would be on the fourth Monday of April, I would have to remember to order my trail pass for June. Because if, like, if I've already ordered the one for May already, it would just stop coming in. So I'd have to order the one for June. So it's hard to remember the fourth Monday is sort of a random thing. So I set up a cron, and I kept forgetting. If you forget it, you get a discount if you order it through school. Otherwise, you're paying full yeah. price. Yeah. Um, so it sucks if you forget it. You're paying like another 20 bucks or something a month. And then you might want to rob it for 20 bucks when you're, when you're in grad school. So I wanted to write a cron. So today, I think like just the calendars are kind of smarter, and I probably would just set it that way. Um, but you know, that's not a shoddy script then. So I wanted to write my own script to do it. So what this does is this is this is runs out of cron and all of this really does, is, so we have a list of months, and it figures out what the next month is, because I always wanted to tell it what the next month was, because like, I might not want to get one for December, because like, Drexel goes on break about the second week in, and I might not want to get it then. Um, or I might know that I'm going to be going away in like August. But you know, it's confusing, because it's always two months out, and whatever. Um, so this tells me what the, the month two out is, and then the rest of this just sends up an email. So it, so you can see also extra shoddiness I'm using Qmail to send an email now. Um, so it's like extra crappiness. Um, this is Pearl's way of saying that I want to I want to open that up as a pipe and I want to, it's redirecting standard, my standard out is going to be the standard in for Qmail inject, which is, I could have used send mail the same way, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then if you want to send an email, at least in Perl, or in anything that lets you deal with text like this, it's pretty straightforward. You just have to give it you know, a from, a to, and a subject. And you don't even really need the subject. You probably could even skip the from if you really want to. You really just need the to. Um, and then a space, and then the body of the message. And the body of the message is just uh, this is the last day to order a trail pass, what the deadline is, and blah, blah, blah. Once it hits EOF, then I close it, and once I close it, it goes and sends it off. And you can see extra shoddiness. It says send mail didn't close nicely instead of Qmail not closing nicely. Um, so where was this was? Oh, right. So I have a lot of things open here. Um, sending it, and you definitely can't read this. And this was kind of the point of the talk that I did. That it's. It's kind of tricky to send something on the fourth Monday of a month in Cron because it doesn't directly support it. You can say, um, I don't know. It's, I explain it all and I forget all the details. But you needed two things. You needed, yeah. um, what is it? That this says that it's going to go at 8 a.m. So this is, the, this is at zero minutes. This is 8 a.m. And this says that I want to I want to run it every day from the 22nd to the 28th because any one of those days could be the fourth Monday. You can't just ask it to do for if you if you said what was the tricky thing? So if I said this end Monday, which I think is like this next column, I would it would go out. It would run on the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, and every Monday of the month. So they end together. They don't or they, they or they or together. They don't add together. Um, 
So instead, what I have to do is run it seven days, all seven days, it could possibly be the second, the, the fourth Monday of the month. And then in this, in this uh, shell script that I have, this little kind of shell snippet, if you want to even call it a script, then I check if the date is Monday. And if the date is Monday, then I go and run my script. Otherwise, it just stops. So, is that shoddy? That is not a shoddy, a cool shoddy and effective. I, I have a really similar dumb issue because the cycle gets picked up on a certain day of the week, depending on the month. But I need to remember the day before. Oh, that's awful. And so, <laughs> that's the terrible. day before is not the same week of the month. And so I can never set up calendar reminders quite right. I bet I could write a script. I'm going to steal your script. What? Steal your script? Your trash will be picked up on the 175th hour of this month. That's terrible. I can't believe someone would do that. That's awful. I can barely remember getting my trash out. Yeah, you know, it's actually reminders, brilliant if you're the recycler. The reminders have gotten a lot less. smarter than they used to be. So yeah, but no. So I have this problem. So it's it's like a every first Wednesday or something like that, right? But yeah. the first Tuesday is, and I need to remember the night. But you remember before. the day before. But so the, the, the way you need to set it for the day is Tuesday the and have a reminder that's like 24 hours before that. Yeah, I've had to do that to. Like I like to, uh, I don't know. Even even Google Calendar is still awful for some like the last day of the month kind of stuff. So I think for like first Tuesday it works. I know it works for plug. So um, that, however I set that up, works okay. But so, there's been some other stuff that just you can't do without backwards rules, oh, like you were saying. Oh, so then it turned out that um, I think that first one I might miss because that was like right around the time in the morning that I'd be getting ready to like going to the shower or something like that, and then I'd leave for the train and I might forget. So um, I actually had it bug me every four hours all day long from, from I think, 4 o'clock in the morning all the way until, like, midnight. So that way, getting emails every four hours about this, eventually, even if I put it off the first one, it would keep bugging me and bugging me. Into my life. I think once I set this up, I never, it never bothered me. So. I went too long the last time, so I'm going to stop here. I like it. Perfect. Well, last but definitely least. <laughs> do we have a vote at the end of the crappy script? We should do that. We should. Well, mine's not even, both of your guys has been in, has been in code revision. This is not in code revision. So I have no, the second one is not in revision at all. This is. I was showing that on a blog post I wrote like, like uh, when did I read this? In uh, 2012. Alright, so I recently went to this conference in Vegas, it was an IBM conference, and it was a really huge conference, there was like 40,000 attendees and there was like 4,000 sessions across multiple casinos. It was literally, I'm not even exaggerating, it was like a 1.6 mile walk from my hotel room to the classes. So it was massive. And, and typically when you go to these more commercial conferences, at the end of the conference, they give you this nice little package that shows you, here's all the presentations from all the presenters. You can just download it, that way you can go back to your company. Because you just spend $2,600 $2, to get into the conference, you spend you know, a thousand bucks to get there, and you're spending another fifteen hundred dollars in hotel, and then probably another couple thousand in food and drink, and other debauchery. So you like to get the presentations at the end of the conference, so you can get back to your company and kind of spread it out, and they can kind of see everything that's going on. Well, at this conference, they didn't do that. So there is. So on this page is the the conference portal, and you can filter by, you know, topic, cloud containers databases, infrastructure, whatever, but there was they didn't offer any way to download all the materials, so you had to go through and pick the individual session IDs to, in order to download it. Well, I thought that was nonsense. So what I did was, is I logged into the main site here, and you see there's 2,700 more sessions to download, and I just sat here and did this for two hours while watching 
billions for a shell and HBO. So I just kept doing this for two hours, exactly like this. Two, two, two finger down, click. Two finger down, click. And eventually I got down to 2,700 and I never felt so much better in my life. Even, yeah, it, it was great for him. So I got all the way down there after a couple hours. Could, could you have asked Watson to do it for you? It says to ask Watson up the top. It, it probably could have, but then I would have had to pay money or something, I don't know. So I got down, I kept clicking this, kept clicking this, and finally after hours of, of Mac gestures, I got all the way down, and then I was like, okay, well then all I did was I just swept Chrome, and I went save page X. And then it downloaded, this monstrosity <laughs> of just nonsense for <laughs> you know like a million lines of HTML, CSS, JavaScript. JavaScript. So I wrote this one liner that's not even a script that just aux out. Basically, if you go to um, if you go to PDF here, uh, I basically aux out this ng href. Uh, and I got a one-liner of all the stuff, and um, so I got I got all the the lines, and I, I wrote this crappy script that just uh, cats the PDFs and downloads them, right? So that was easy. And then I was like, great, now I can just send this this payload of PDFs, like two thousand PDFs, out to my company, and they can bask in the glory of, and you know. Uh, higher education through conferences. Well, I was wrong. So when I downloaded it, um, it was terrible. It, uh, it's just thousands of thousands of PDFs. Some of them had names, but I would say 75% of them were just gibberish files. So I was like, how am I gonna give someone 2,000 PDFs with no index, with no information about anything. So then I was like... That's why we have journalists. Yeah, so then I was like, all right, well, if you open up every single PDF, just the laws of you know, modern uh, presentation and IT, the, the, the slide always is the first one, and it always has the title and then probably some stuff about the presenter, yada, yada. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just write a script that, you know, scrapes the first page and then uh, and then renames it. But, but, wasn't the title of the thing that you scraped to get the PDF link? No, not that I could find. Well, maybe, but I didn't think that far ahead. So I'm way too far down the rabbit hole now. So, I <laughs> actually I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I'm probably going to go back and probably. You know, I did try that. And that is the comment that all these dreams. <laughs> Let's just take one. Obviously, it's hard to find in that, right? It's a, it's a mess. No, you know, I did look at this, and there wasn't. Um, I see a Mandalay Bay cell. Yeah, there, it's, it's this one right here. So here's the PDF, and. I, I don't know. I can't remember. That's. Not, I don't see, you're right that I don't see it there, but yeah, I didn't. Um, I thought they were there in the display, right? Like because so if I look up like uh, iTalk, yeah. So it's in the it's in the file name, but it's actually not anywhere there. But if you look on the website, it kind of is. So I don't know if there's some yeah. JavaScript going on where yeah, it's right. Yeah, that's not, what I was. That's probably what, what I was referring to. So I went the other way of crazy. And I spent hours downloading it, and then I was like, okay, well, how do I do this thing? So um, I first tried to write a script that scrapes the um, scrapes the PDF. So I opened up like this guy, right? And then I tried to figure out a way to scrape it. And it kind of worked, kind of didn't. Like, I, I could figure out, obviously, the first PDF. I downloaded a Ruby gem, and I was like, all right. It opened up the first page, and I was able to scrape. But it would do things like, you know, it, it would capture this front line, and then there might be a couple new line characters, and two elements later in the array. And I couldn't get a, find a really good way to consistently have the PDFs name them. And I really wanted to get this payload together for the rest of my company, so I, uh, 
wrote this crappy script. And uh, what it does is it opens up the PDF for me. And then I say, OK, um, go over here. I'm going to take this guy like this. Okay. Rename is, uh, I get where I'm going with this. It's going to be awful. Rename, yes. Some of them are renamed fine. And then the file name is going to be uh, focus uh, on the, your You could cut and paste it from the PDF at this point. I could, but I don't want the spaces in the name. And any of the weird control characters okay. or whatever. Uh, and then uh, your people, how AI dot PDF. Just say that. Uh, and then, the and then, so I, I had a bunch of buckets and basically subfolders. So this is um, about AI. So I hit AI here, uh, and then that's it. So I can close this guy out, and I uh, click the next one. It opens up a whole other one. Rinse and repeat, and it renames the files, and uh, it puts them sorted by AI. So the one we just uh, is in there somewhere. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what it does, um, and it's really terrible. It's a really, really unfortunate situation I find myself in. And I think I have about 50% of them done, and I figured out if I do 30 per day, I'll be able to get it done in 30 days. Um, yeah, so that's my really, really crappy script. But I'm going to get it done, because I, I want to. So, so how much, so how much battery consumption do each of your crappy scripts uh, consume? Right now? <laughs> Probably a lot. So here's the actual script. We'll do a little, oops, a little crappy walkthrough here. Um, very simply, it opens up the PDF. You, know, you get it. It's just, you know, do you want to rename it? And then it renames it, uh, and then it, it just moves it to the subfolder. Uh, so yeah, so I'm probably, I don't know, six hours deep into this thing, and uh, I plan on spending another six hours on it. And then eventually I'll be able to take this sorted folder um, with all these different PDFs in them, um, and I'm going to upload them to like S3, and then I'll probably put them in like DynamoDB and create a word map, and then people can have an actual index based on the file names. And, they could search for cloud, or they could search for IoT, or Amazon, or Azure, uh, and download the PDFs that they want. So yeah, it's my really crappy script. The crappiest crap. What were all the percents at the top of your screen? Uh, CPU. CPU. Some Apple thing. Script I am. Anybody else got a crappy script they want to show off? Probably, it probably do salt, but it's like it's kind of like in the same vein of last time of improving someone else's crappy script, although it's not it's not totally improved yet. It's not exactly even a script. Eight fifty. If we want to, for about ten minutes, we can go over to the office. I'm not going to go over, but people will. Does anyone else want to do anything? Anyone? Before I shut her down. So hopefully by next year, I'll have a whole cobbled together home automation system built from random PDUs and. <laughs> Especially PDUs, exhaust fans. Yeah, you know. Have you, have you looked at uh, Home Assistant? It's like an open source uh, home automation suite that's kind of sandboxy. It's not like um, smart things, it's not like an appliance, but it's yeah, you know, it's a set of tools, open source. I have not, but it sounds uh, potentially interesting. Home yeah, assistant. look up Home Assistant. It's really popular mm -hmm. FOSS. Automation. Isn't next month's uh, talk from Rich Home some kind of home automation? 
Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. O open ham. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah so yeah. open ham, yeah. HA, -A uh, yeah, HAB. There's one called, um, I use smart things because I'm just like that. Um, well, well, well all, you, all you know is enterprise, so it's... Yeah, that's what we use in enterprise. No, um, no it's just set on time. It's like <laughs> plug and play. So, so John, John Carr, this is sort of in the ring of home automation, at, at Plug Central a few months ago gave this talk about, so he lives in this big like old row house somewhere in the city. Okay. And he wanted, he's got speakers, he's got a central music server, and he wanted to have music playing on the speakers, it had to be the same music on all the speakers throughout his house. So he's playing some song, no matter what room he goes to, he's playing the same song. And there are commercial applications that do this. Sonos is probably the most famous one that I've heard of. If he had bought Sonos, he, would, he could have spent a couple hundred, or another thousand bucks where these things cost, and probably been done. But he didn't want to do that. So he wanted to cobble something together on his own with Raspberry Pis and, um, I don't know, God only knows what. It's tricky if you want to do that. Because then you have multiple computers and you have to get them in sync and keep them in sync with the time, the clocks, and everything. Yeah, it's a mess. I have no home automation. My, my, Home automation is light switches on the wall. This is my first foray into home automation. I, I really it came down to okay, I have this thing. What can I do with it? Online? You need to have it be. You clearly need to have to have it be voice activated. Well, actually, I was talking to somebody at work. Like it would be super easy to wire this to like an Alexa or something. You need to you need to um, be like Scotty and like computer. But, well, so what I tinkered with today, which I didn't cover in my talk, is um, an IVR that lets me turn the fan on. So I can dial in. Uh, it does, a, it does a, a DID lookup on my phone to make sure I'm calling from my cell phone, and then I can press one to turn the fan off and two to turn the fan, or the other way around, one to turn it on, two to turn it off. Um, and that is what almost really voice. <laughs> or you need to write. You can write yourself a little Android app. So that yeah, that would be super simple. I mean, it's already a web page. It's just I mean. Really, I could just encapsulate that into a bookmark on my home screen, too. I added the dumb little make it scale properly on an Android device tags, so um, it works reasonably well for my phone now. How's, uh, how's the farting simulator going on? I, you know, I haven't worked on farting simulator in a while. That's probably a first, that probably qualifies as a crappy script. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is literally a crappy script. Literally yes. a crappy script. Definitely. This is what smart things looks like. So it's it's just a nice little interface for probably like cue bulbs and your echo bees and like any other smart devices, but you're kind of locked into their ecosystem so much. Well, well, that's why Andy likes it. You lo it locks you into their yeah, ecosystem you just like the database to run it. Yeah, I need no. It, it comes with a nice appliance. That's why I start. I saw I, I I bought a Pi and I was going to put Home Assistant on it. And then I was sinking too many hours in getting it working. I'm like, I can't do this. I need a, I need a nice garden, walled in, just comfort. Wait, so so does that does that appliance run EIX? Nope. It runs some proprietary appliance nonsense. Sad. Can't yeah. even get on it. Sad. Yeah. No, I, I would need 30 fans and an yeah, industrial PU. Like yeah, 220 hookup to get an affordable you know, power six. So I was going to mention, like, if anybody else wants to do the dumb thing that I did, these PDUs are, like, super cheap on eBay, the old Baytex. Um, the newer ones actually have a web UI, but honestly, I think this works better than having a web UI because it's easier to make it do what you want from, like, after I wrote the expect script, I'm like, okay, I'm going to make a cron job that runs this thing and turns the outside lights on and off. But, the right times. So it's like, okay, done. Um, and then you can still override it from the terrible web UI. So, I mean, other than the obvious, like, security hole um, that's in it right now, I don't think there's any, I mean, it's crappy, but it's not bad. I was giving you a hard time. Really, it's, it's on the local network. It is, but, you know, I... The execute arbitrary commands on a Linux box is less than 
<laughs> Unless you're like secured by web or something like that. Then yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that might be like bad. Anybody who wants to, right? I actually, somebody was giving me crap on plug a little bit about, oh, you're talking to whatever talent. I'm like, well, it's on my local wired network. Yeah, so it's, smart. yes, I'm talking in plain text. And if you want to splice into the network cable, and, I guess over Wi Fi it is more vulnerable, but not. You could set up a VLAN that's can't, it's not accessible from Wi Fi. I, I mean, it's on a Raspberry Pi right now. I could just. Yeah, I could, that's probably the easy way to just put it on a VLAN. VLAN that's not accessible from your regular Wi Fi. Guess Wi Fi. Like the Pi. Well, the problem is the Pi only has one interface. You can use the USB as an interface, though, can't you? Yeah. With an adapter? Yes, that would work. So. Yeah. Into Pi, out of Pi, and directly. I don't even need a VLAN. I can just connect. Yeah. Well, assuming I'm, I'm reasonably sure the ancient Natec doesn't do. A, and, and what is it, MDIX? But the Pi should. So I could make an old, uh, good old school uh, crossover cable do that. Or I could use the serial connection. Yeah. But I kind of. What's that? You gotta use a serial connection. Yeah, well, so the cool. problem with the serial connection is that the cable I used to reset this thing back to factory so I could configure it at all, I stole from work and I have to take it back. Um, I think I have to take it back. I'm gonna ask JP tomorrow if he actually cares. Because they have like 30 of these cables. Because like, this would have not been possible if not for the fact that Port Isle has 30 old Baytech TVs <laughs> yes. down at the data center with a big pile of cables. That's awesome. Otherwise, I would have been ordering a I don't know. I mean, there really? was like it would have been like thirty bucks for a cable. At which point, it probably would have waited another year because when it's like, oh, I can just plug this in and do it, versus I can order this thing and I might do something cool with it. Anyway, it was fun. Let's take a pizza.